I'm Liz, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm powerless. And I love that Joanne is part of, you know, a, a, a network of women in our area that, you know, she can, she'll be in my back pocket if I need her, and I'll be in hers if she needs me, and we have this common bond. That's one of the things. I mean, I love so many, I love everything about Alcoholics Anonymous, but the, the fellowship and the community of women is just incredible. I wasn't like that when I first got sober, I can tell you that. So my sobriety uh, date is January 4th, 1997. And, uh, you know, when I first got sober, I used to think people bragged about that um, because I kind of wanted that, but I didn't want that. It was really a twisted thing. And then another part of me didn't believe it. I couldn't believe that people could stay sober a week, 30 days, a year, 30 years, 10 years. I just couldn't believe it. And I thought they were all full of it. So, but I'm here and uh, I can attest and witness that that is possible one day at a time. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background of what the family was like for me uh, before, you know, before I came into AAA. I um, was bounced around in foster homes and, um, and I'm one of the people that uh, saw a lot of things little girls shouldn't have to see and experienced a lot of things that little girls shouldn't have to experience. So I grew up with all, with a, uh, a huge defense uh, mechanisms that like served me for some time, but also were very destructive uh, to me and for me. And, uh, but I didn't know any of that until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I just knew that I did not want to be like my mother and I did not want to be like my father. I'm proud to say that I'm a first citizen of Canada. My mom was uh, born on the reservation. She's Ojibwe and that's where I was born. And um, I can say that I'm proud of that today, but I wasn't always. So there was more healing that needed to happen with that as well. Um, so <laughs> I was put into the foster care system. Uh, my mom married, uh, a, a, you know, at the time, what she thought a wonderful uh, French Canadian guy from Quebec. So we moved to Quebec and I only knew how to speak English. So I had to learn how to speak French very quickly. And um, she uh, had a hard time adjusting because the only life that she ever knew was the life that she had on the reservation and her level of education wasn't that great. Um, so she really had a hard time uh, fitting in. But um, anyway, there was six uh, children. I was the oldest and uh, eventually, uh, you know, she didn't drink and but eventually she gave in because she was always home alone. And um, for her, it was not a nice outcome. Uh, she died of cirrhosis of the liver about uh, 20 years ago, actually, last, yeah, 20 years ago last week. Um, and I had not seen her before that for about 20 years. I didn't even know if she was still alive or not, but somehow, some way, one of my biological sisters got in touch with me and said, you might want to come. And I was at that place in my recovery where I was uh, I started to understand what alcoholism was all about and that, uh, you know, I had this thing too. And I went to see her and I remember her asking me if I could, if she could, if I could forgive her. And I told her that uh, she had nothing to be forgiven for because I was like her that I was an alcoholic and she first thing she said is like don't drink baby don't drink no matter what don't drink I said don't worry I said I haven't drank in a long time and I said it's not my plan today and um, so I got to see her and you know make some kind of amends and some kind of closure but there was a lot more healing that needed to happen with that and it happened over time but she did she was a victim of that and so was my father just a few years ago and uh, but what brought me into AA was it's my life. I didn't have the kind, you know, I didn't want to be like my parents, right? So I set out to, you know, work, get an education, get a good job, 
make some money. You know, like I had this fairy tale fantasy of what a family life should look like, you know, like the Hallmark Channel, you know, the white picket friends, the men, you know, the perfect guy, the children, the money in the bank, and like nothing ever goes wrong in your life, you know. So I had this false idea because I had no idea of what was a normal life, what a normal childhood was like, what a normal upbringing was like. So I was always looking for that fantasy somewhere. I didn't know it was a fantasy. I just thought that that was the ultimate goal. So I, because I wanted that more than anything else in the world, I became a control freak. So I learned to manage drinking and working and going to school and making money and paying my bills and doing all of that. So I had this lifestyle that for me served me very well for a long time. And, uh, you know, I was married uh, very young uh, to a man that was, you know, 17 years older than I was. And he was a wonderful man. And uh, in my life, that's probably the only regret I have is not loving him right. But I didn't know how to love anybody. I didn't know how to love myself. And I certainly didn't know how to accept that. I didn't know any of that until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. So a lot of people are probably saying, what has that got to do with drinking? For this alcoholic, it has everything to do with it because I didn't know how to manage my emotions. I didn't know how to handle my feelings. And I was reacting to everything in my life. Anytime that I was confronted with anything, I had a react a reactor button that was incredible. So it was like, get out of the way, she's reacting. You know, because that's the only way I knew how to process anything that didn't go my way or anything that was painful or anything that was scary or anything that I didn't want or that's just the only way that I knew how to react. And um, anyway, I, at one point, um, I got pregnant and I, uh, the, the man that I was involved with didn't want anything to do with the child and that was fine. I didn't need him. You know, because women, you know, they can do it all now. You know, we can do it all. We can raise a child on our own. We can have a career. We can have money. We can do all of that stuff. We can be nurturing. We can be loving. And I will say, I still say it, that was the happiest time in my life being pregnant. Because I, you know, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't, I wasn't smoking cigarettes. I wasn't doing pot. I was not doing caffeine. I was taking care of myself. And that was the first time in my life that I felt so much love for another being and he wasn't even born yet and for me it was like the prize it was like okay I don't have the man in the white picket fence but I got a child and this is my family and no one is going to take him away from me and I'm never going to let anyone take him away from me but I lost my son when I was about six months pregnant and that was my it's still the greatest pain of my life and uh, that's when I my the control that I thought I had the the managing skills that I thought I had took on a whole new spin I totally lost my control I lost my my direction I didn't I, I it's like every day after I lost my son I would get up shower go to work and on the way home I would hit these three bars on the way home have a couple of drinks at each go home and drink until I passed out cried myself to sleep or I would think about how I could end my miserable life because what was the point of living if this was good if the greatest thing that ever happened to me was taken away what was the point you know and that went on for almost a year and I don't know how that happened to this day but on that night on January 4th 1997 I had my last drink and I woke up the next morning trying to recall what happened because I was one of those people when I was drinking especially at the end of my drinking I was a drunk dialer you know, the people that call people in the middle of the night and give them a piece of their mind. 
<laughs> you know, they didn't have texting then. <laughs> I see people texting, not me. I was a drunk dialer. I just dial a number and give you exactly what I thought about you. And so I was trying to recall, and I couldn't recall who I called. But I woke up that morning face down on the kitchen floor. The kitchen door was open. And at that time, we had telephone books. We didn't have Google or Alexa or anything like that. We had telephone book, and Alcoholics Anonymous was circled. And to this day, I have no idea who did that. I have no idea. But somebody knew that I was in trouble. And I think pretty much my friends, my coworkers probably knew that. But I, um, you know, that whole day, I, I was pretty sick and pretty miserable. And uh, I decided that I would try this thing, Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was just going to go for a little bit just to get a grip on things because I could always put the drink down physically. I, I did plenty of times before that um, because, you know, I was always like riding that line pretty tight, but this time I went over the line and I needed some help with it. So I, I couldn't manage it anymore. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go here and get some help and learn how to manage it. And then I'll just go on my merry way and figure things out. So I went to my first uh, meeting on January 6th and um, not really knowing what AA was about because I had tried a bunch of things before that and, um, you know, nothing really worked. I tried different churches. I tried different support groups. I tried therapy. I tried counseling. I tried all kinds of stuff. Um, but I didn't think that drinking was my problem. I thought that something else was my problem. So when I got to AA, I went to that meeting on January 6th, and it was a small big book meeting. There was probably about, I don't know, seven or eight people at this meeting, and they were all sitting around a table, and it was a big book meeting. And the format was everyone read a paragraph or two, and they would comment on that. Well, this is my first meeting. First of all, I couldn't, I had the attention span of a gnat, so I couldn't concentrate or focus on anything. So I have no idea what we read. But it came my turn to read because everyone was taking a turn. And I, I read what I read. I don't know what it was to this day. I just don't know. But I said, I'm Liz, and I guess I'm an alcoholic. So I said, I, I said and I feel like I'm going to throw up saying that because that was the last thing I wanted to do is just admit that I was like my parents. You know, I just didn't want to do that. And um, this gentleman who's still went to that meeting until the meeting stopped uh, and he's a, a dear friend of mine now he, he, he looked across the table and he put his hand out and he said isn't it liberating to know where you belong and I looked at him like he had four heads because I had no idea what he was talking about yet but I know when I was I, it, it really upset me right so I'm trying to watch my language so it really upset me in that moment. But then when I was driving home from the meeting, I started to breathe a different way than I was before. There, something had happened and it made me want to go to another meeting because after that meeting, you know, there were two, three people that gave me phone numbers. They gave me a meeting list book. You know, back then we had a meeting list book and it told you what the closed meetings were, what the handicap meetings were, what the gay and lesbian meetings were, what they were all about and where they were and then they circled the ones that they would be at so that I would have a face to look at when I went to that meeting. So I followed those people, <clears throat> excuse me, to all these meetings and they were all, you know, what I used to call old timers, now I call them long timers and, um, and they were all old guys. <laughs> they just were and I went to these meetings and they said Liz you, you really should like try to you know connect with women you know and get yourself a sponsor and they explained to me what a sponsor was I, I thought I don't know what I thought a sponsor was but I said what I'm like so what I said is this person helping me to pay for membership or something because I had no idea right and they said, no, a sponsor is, is someone that's going to help you understand what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. 
and perhaps guide you through the steps and perhaps help you grow up a little bit. Maybe you'll get lucky and they'll be your friend, but they'll always be there to support you, someone to talk to if you feel like drinking or if you're having a bad moment, right? So I really like the way that they explain that, but I wasn't too keen on the whole woman thing. Um, I wasn't very good at making friends with women because um, I was pretty outspoken about stuff and that kind of like a turn off <laughs> to, women, to other women or it scared them or, you know, they used to, anyway, they used to call me all kinds of names. But um, so I went to these meetings, but there was something magical about these old guys and I'm going to call them old guys because um, I'm, I'm there now. So there was something magical about them because in their wisdom, they knew what would work for a control freak like me, someone who liked to manage things, is they got me involved in service work. That's the first thing they did. Okay, you show up early at this meeting, I'm going to show you how to make the coffee. I'm going to show up early, I'm going to show you how to set up the chairs, how to take them down, and why it's important. Put the literature out. And you know what? That really helped. And I'm, I w I'm so grateful because that's the first thing that like got me kind of hooked and interested. It's like I had somewhere to go, right? I had somewhere to go instead of going to the bar uh, because I had quit that job that I was working at because it was an environment where you could drink while you were work while you were working as long as you didn't get you know hammered. But I knew that if I stayed there that I would be still getting hammered every day. And I had enough money accumulated where I could take, you know, a month or two off and then just find something else, which I did eventually. So it gave me a lot of time to go to a lot of meetings. You know, they said, go to 90 meetings in 90 days, you know, and I wasn't too excited about it, but I did it. And I actually did more than that. And they said, show up early and leave late. So I would show up right when the meeting would start. <laughs> And I would like leave as soon as the meeting ended because I just was a little, I was, I shouldn't say a little, I was a lot skittyish. I just like didn't, I didn't like the whole hugging, touching thing in the beginning. Now it's like the thing I miss the most because <laughs> I just do. Um, but uh, anyway, they said, you know, Liz, stick with it and just keep coming no matter what. And, you know, maybe get yourself a woman sponsor. And they said, maybe you should get a woman that really scares you, you know, and I didn't quite understand that. And I said, what do you mean by that? They said, you know, one that like kind of like when you listen to her, she makes you uncomfortable. And um, and I said, why do you want that? They said, well, that's probably the woman that you need because maybe you can relate to her or maybe she'll help you tell the truth about yourself and look at your truth. And I was like not too happy about that, but I stalked this woman for like a couple of weeks. I went to every meeting she went to. And honestly, the reason I really liked her is because she was so popular in AA. Everybody liked her. You know, every, every time someone saw Ellen coming, they'd be like, oh, Ellen, Ellen, Ellen. You know, and I was like, oh, she must be somebody. Okay, all right, well, maybe I'll get to know her. But I really liked her because she was an engineer. She was a single mom, and she had her life together. And when she talked, she told the truth. So I thought, you know, I mean, that's what I heard. I heard, I heard the truth, and she talked about things that were uncomfortable. And uh, so finally I went up to her, and I, and I um, you know, and she's like, I said to her, I said, you know, Ellen, I said, I'm looking for a sponsor. And I was like, I was wondering if you'd be willing to be my sponsor. I'm like, but I got to tell you, I'm like, you really scare the crap out of me. And she said, scare the crap out of you. She said, you scare me. I've been trying to dodge you for a couple of weeks because I knew you were coming my way. <laughs> so, but she really believed what her sponsor told her that, you know, God brings people together for a reason. You know, whether it's for a short time or if it's for a long time to learn something from each other, you know, and she really believed that she said, she said, you think you will learn something from me, but I will learn something from you, too. And she really believed that I, I didn't buy into that in the beginning, but I will say that um, I 
she used to make me call her at the same time every day. You know, we didn't have cell phones then. You know, they had the answering machines. You had to press a button, go back, and then listen. You know, that was like this. It was terrible. But anyway, I, I had to call her every day at the same time. And sometimes she would be... Uh, sometimes she would answer the phone. Sometimes she wouldn't. So whenever she didn't answer, I'd be like, oh, good, she didn't answer. So I could leave her a quick message what I was doing, where I was going, and, you know, what was going on. And, and sometimes she'd answer, and I'd be like, oh, God, now I'm going to talk to her. So, um, but that's how it went for the first few months. And then eventually she said, you know, we never talked about the steps. Are you, you know, aren't you going to, like, aren't you going to try to do that? You know, and we'd talk about the steps. And I'd go to step meetings, and I thought that that was enough. Right. And uh, she'd always tell me, Liz, don't debate the steps until you've tried it. Until you've done them, you've got nothing to debate. Right. So I would always I used to tell her, I'm like, I don't like the way they're written. I'm like, it all seems to be from men, men, men. I'm like, and there's like old English in there. Maybe they should rewrite the whole thing. She goes, you know what, Liz, when you do the steps, she said, if you really think they need to be rewritten, we'll talk about it then. But until then, you got nothing. No debating. And, uh, I, you know, <laughs> she gets so mad at me. And sometimes I call her up. This is like right before I started the steps. I was having all these emotions. And I wasn't drinking, and I didn't feel like drinking. But I certainly wanted to smack some people around. Right? I just was just like so impatient and intolerant with people. And I would call her out. I'm like, why am I so miserable? I'm like, I'm not drinking. I'm going to meetings. I'm doing service work. You know, I'm like, I'm doing all of these things. I'm like, I don't understand why I still don't feel good. I'm like, why don't I feel good? She said, are you drinking? And I said, no. She said, then you did something good today. She goes, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. The things I must earn, the things I must experience, the things I must enjoy. I used to hate it when she'd tell me all those acronyms about time. She said, but when you get to a place where you are in pain, where you're going to drink, and you can't stand the pain that you're in anymore, she said, then maybe you'll be willing to do the work. And I, it came. That day came. And I was about 10 months sober almost 11 months sober and we went through the steps and when we got to the fifth step where I had to pour my guts out because I still wasn't right right in my head for me it's always like what's going on in my head I would give her a little bit of my dirt and then she'd share some stuff and I'd be like okay I'll give her a little bit more I'm like that way you know if she talks about any of my stuff to anywhere I got some of hers that's how I thought <laughs> You know, but that's how it worked for me. I had to learn how to trust another human being, but I had to learn how to trust myself too. After we were done with the fifth step, for the first time in my life, for the first time since I had been pregnant, I felt a connection to another human being. I cannot explain it other than I just felt love for another person. I allowed myself to feel love from another person. I didn't have to put up. I didn't have to put out. I didn't have to give up anything. I didn't have to compromise anything. I didn't have to pay for anything. Nobody had to pay any, me for anything. It was just a mutual experience. And there was like no touching. There was nothing except for what I had in my heart. And I had never felt that in my life. And to me, that was amazing. I had that feeling briefly when I was pregnant with my son. And I was like, I can still have that feeling. But well, what am I going to do with all of it? I don't know how to use, I don't know how to, to, to keep going with that. And, uh, you know, and eventually, before I finished my, my fifth, my step work with her, I had accumulated a year continuous sobriety and I, that blew my mind and I remember her giving me my medallion and I looked at it and she said what's the matter you, she, she said you almost look sad I said a little and she said why I'm like 
this whole year I've been so busy going to meetings almost every day and doing service work and running here and running there. And I said, and, you know, I began my step work. I'm like, but not one of my so-called friends or old drinking buddies called me to check up on me in this year to see, hey, Liz, where you been? What's going on? What are you doing? You know, there's nothing like that. And um, she said, okay, well, maybe now it's time to, like, learn how to make some friends. You know, sober friends. You can learn how to have some fun in AA, you know, and have some fun with sober people. And, uh, you know, and I did. And I got to tell you, I have more fun now than I ever did in my whole life. And, uh, you know, eventually I met a guy on AA campus who'd been sober, you know, 10 years or whatever. And um, I went back to college. He went back to college. Uh, we got married. We started a business. We had the dream, you know, everything that they tell you you can have. You know, like I had that white picket fence. I had the guy. And I, you know, and I, I could, at this point I had found out that I could not have children. So that wasn't going to happen. And then he decided he didn't want the dream anymore. He wanted something else. And that ended. And I was, I think, five years sober at that time. And um, it, was, it was very painful for me. Because here I was, my first breakup. I'm like, I've been, I'm like, I've been doing everything right. I don't understand what's going on. You know, and I and I kept going to meetings, and now I'm sponsoring, you know, people, and I'm working with people. And I'm still working with my sponsor, and I'm like, I don't understand. But what was what I didn't know at that time is that, you know, that relationship ended. You know, we closed that door, divorce, blah blah blah. But I didn't allow myself time to process and grieve that loss that I jumped into another one into another one into another one and I always had the same pattern which I didn't know at that time but I was still going to meetings doing the steps right so every time that I would go through a set of steps I would uncover something else and what I realized every time I went through the steps is that I was getting a little closer and a little closer to the root cause of my inability to deal with life on life's terms, my inability to allow people to love me, my biggest inability on how I didn't know how to love myself, right? So I was getting closer to it and I was always choosing the same type of men, the angry guys or the guys that needed to be saved. You know, poor Liz, she's so, uh, you know, whatever. So I didn't do everything perfect in AA. And, and if any of you have done it perfect, good for you, really. But that didn't happen to me. Okay, so I didn't always say everything right in AA. But I never set out to hurt another human being on purpose. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've always done my best to come from within here. That's one of the first things those old timers taught me in the beginning. They said, Liz, when you go to any kind of meeting, don't look at people with your eyes. Don't listen to them with your ears. Come from in here, from in your heart. And he says, all of that other stuff will fall away. Then you won't worry so much about what that girl is wearing and how she's carrying herself around the guys or what that cute guy might be doing later. You know, just go to a meeting to go to a meeting, you know, and listen from in here, all the other stuff will fall away. And I'm really grateful for that advice, because it like brought me back to a very simple and core thing that I was taught when I was a little girl. And eventually, it brought me back to um, the spiritual path that I have in my life. But that was the beginning of that. And I I am so grateful for all the pain that I've had in AA. And I still have moments where I have pain. But I don't, I don't drink. I don't take a pill. I don't smoke marijuana. I, you know, I don't throw myself in the arms of a guy anymore. 
<laughs> I did that, you know, and um, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful that I don't have to do any of that today. There, you know, in the big book, it does tell us, you know, that sometimes we need outside help with some things, you know, and I did seek outside help with some things. I was about nine, almost 10 years sober um, when I hit the biggest bottom of my life. This time it wasn't a physical bottom or an emotional bottom. You know, like it was when I first got sober, that was an emotional bottom for me. And, you know, maybe a little bit of a physical bottom. But what happened to me in my 10th year of sobriety was a spiritual bottom. It's not because the first 10 years of my sobriety, I didn't believe in something bigger than me, but I did. I did believe in something big, bigger than me, but I wasn't allowing it to work in my life. I was still trying to run the show. And I hit my spiritual bottom like nothing before. And I was close to a drink, even though I was going to meetings, I was doing the steps, I was doing service work, I was involved, I had people I was sponsoring, I was working with a sponsor. But I had this incredible spiritual bottom. And what happened, I'm so grateful that I had a different sponsor at this time because my first sponsor relapsed and trust me when I tell you that was a bigger pain for me than my divorce because the person that I had on a pedestal she was not that person anymore I'm like what I'm like where am I going what's I just felt like I lost my compass when she fell off you know but it also taught me something about any one of us can pick up at any moment. It doesn't matter how long you're sober or what you're doing, right? So for me, I have to keep it to that. But at that time when I hit the spiritual bottom, I had a different uh, sponsor and she was actually a, a school counselor for high school. She was incredibly spiritual and she was very good at holding the mirror up in my face. She would never tell me what to do, but she would get me to look at myself and look and look and look and write and do step work. And I'm so grateful that I had her because she helped me to find, not just find my higher power, but allow it to work for me. And she helped me to let go and let God, that banner that I just resisted in so many ways, let go and let God. She really helped me with that. And I came close to a drink, but I didn't drink. I didn't drink. I had a dollar and 11 cents in my checking account at that time. <laughs> I remember we had the conversation. She said, Liz, you can do a dollar. You can take that dollar and 11 cents. You can go down to the bar and hustle some drinks. I'm sure you probably could. Or maybe you could pray. Say a prayer right now and call me back. I called her back I'm not feeling she goes say it again and I call her back and she made me do that three or four times until I realized that my prayer had no feeling it had no warmth I had not let go and when I did when I finally surrendered right when I finally surrendered I had peace like I hadn't had before I still had a lot of work ahead of me but at least I had found a way to rely on it, to carry me through, to walk with me through all of this stuff that I had to face. And I'm so grateful for that. I was, uh, I spent a few years not being in a relationship like a big girl. And that was probably the best time in my recovery. Those three years were amazing. I did a lot of hiking. I went back to nature, went, found my roots. I got connected with um, people who did lodges. And I, I, I was had the honor of doing vision quests and, and sun dance and just all kinds of things that like brought me home and here. And it brought me a level of peace that I never thought I would ever have. You know, I used to think that if you prayed for peace, you would get it instantly. 
just like I used to think if you prayed for patience, you would get it instantly. And my sponsor smacked me in the head one day and said, stop praying for patience because your higher power is going to send you opportunities to practice your patience. So cut it out. <laughs> you know, so I learned not to, not to pray for outcomes. I learned how to pray to just a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous you know has taught me how to bring it back home you know I mean I can have this incredible spiritual path this spiritual community do all of these things outside the AA that really fuel me that really enhance my recovery but what is at the core of it is the foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous because I know in my heart in my mind in my soul that this disease has me in my head right so I can be all spiritual all day long if I want but if I'm still screwed up in the head guess what I'm still screwed up in the head I'm always going to be screwed up in the head I always am because this disease is that mental spiritual physical emotional it's all of that but if I don't take care of it here in Alcoholics Anonymous I'm totally screwed I'm totally screwed. There are days when there's a lot of stuff going on in this head and I'm not right. And what gets me to the things that are not right is if I don't keep myself in balance with the hungry, angry, lonely, tired, the very basic things. And if I don't apply those three things in that circle, service unity and recovery it's a delicate balance i'm glad that it's a triangle because i have to work at that balance right i have to work at it and if i stay in the center i'm not going to get picked off it's those simple little things that the old timers taught me that sometimes i don't hear enough about in meetings you know and the think 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 it doesn't apply to me <laughs> it doesn't apply to me. Sometimes I can overthink things. Sometimes I can hurt myself if I think too much. The think, think, think just means to me, okay, what happens when I think about a drink? What am, why am I thinking about a drink? So now I have to like process. No, I don't want a drink. Where did that come from? I call somebody and we'll talk it out, right? We'll talk it out. I'm grateful that I know how to pick up a phone today. I'm grateful that I can talk to women today. I'm grateful that I have this incredible network of people. You know, now it's not just in my little community here in, in New Hampshire. It's like worldwide. I went to a meeting in the UK last week. That was so cool. And, you know, so it's like I never, I didn't like Zoom in the beginning. I'll be honest with you. I didn't like it because I like sitting in a chair elbow to elbow with people. And I like hugging people. And I like seeing the people coming in, still screwed up, hanging on, shaking and rattling and rolling. But I'm so grateful for Zoom today. I really am because it keeps me connected to people. The greatest relationships I have today are the ones that I have with my higher power and the one that I have with me. The last year and a half has been the most difficult in my sobriety because... Not because I wanted to, not because I wanted to drink, not this time, but because I suffered, I'm still healing from my first heartache, real heartache ever in my life, where someone decided he didn't want to be with me anymore. And I had to learn how to grieve in a different way. And I had to get some help with that. And but when I, I let go and I let my higher power take me to where I needed to be, where I could be safe and do that work with the 12 steps, with some therapy, with a good network of people. And now I'm at a place where I totally feel safe at all times. And I totally love where I am. and. It's, I don't have the white picket fence, but I got another level of peace that I didn't have before, which brought me to a place where I can live in harmony with people. I can let people be as screwed up as they want. That chat stuff in the beginning was really completely disturbing to me, and but I can 
live with it. I go, you know what? I got to stay in my lane. That's what this last year has done for me is that I've learned how to stay in my lane, not allow outside things or people influence how I feel. I'm responsible for my happiness. It doesn't mean I bury my head in the sand as to not what's not, what's going on in the world. It just means that I allow people to have their journey. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous has done so much for me. That my favorite thing in the big book to read, a lot of people say, oh, it must be the acceptance paragraph. Not me. I'm not good with acceptance. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm not really that great with it. And But what I really love the most in the big book is page 62. Self-centeredness is the root of all my problems when I am disturbed. <laughs> you know, I think about all of that, page 62. I read it every day, every single day. Sometimes I give it a lip service, I go right through, but I read it every day. That's my favorite thing in the big book because I don't want to go back to being selfish, self-centered, and take my will back i just would rather let something bigger than me run the show i'm so grateful to have been asked to, to come to this meeting i always try to find a way around my anniversary to share at least once because i don't get a chance to share a lot anymore um and you know i don't know what it is i mean i think as i got older i don't know if it's an old timer thing i haven't figured that out yet but i feel like i get more quiet now in meetings it's probably because i just like I like hearing other people. The, I mean, I, I'll talk, I can sit here and talk all night because, you know, I can still be self-absorbed. <laughs> but I don't, you know, I'd rather hear from other people, you know. So when I go to meetings, I truly, truly enjoy it. My home group is the Early Birds of Nashua, New Hampshire. We meet at Monday through Friday, 6 a.m., to 7 a.m. and Saturdays and Sundays, 6.30 to 7.30. So if ever you want to check us out, please feel free to do so. Thank you very much, Joanne. Thank you, everyone.